Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and to the podcast. Uh, we're all very fortunate today because I have a real professional on the telephone with me. His name is Bob Schumacher, and Bob and I go back for many years. And he's not only a professional buyer of tax defaulted properties, and he's also a professional seller. And he knows a lot about how to do this in an IRA, which most people are totally confused, but he's been doing that for well over 10 years. And he has experience with tax liens and with tax deeds. So I can rave on about him for hours because uh, he deserves all that. But you're going you're gonna to hear some real words of wisdom over the next 30 minutes or so that we're together on this call. So, Bob, are you on there? Can you hear me okay? I hear you're fine, Ted. Okay. Welcome to the call. And can you just start out and tell us a little bit about yourself? And it's okay to brag a little bit because they're all friends on the call and they'd like to know who you are and where you live and just some uh, pertinent things that you like to tell people about. Ted, I've lived in quite a few places. Right now, I live in Macon, Georgia, and I've lived here for going on 20 years. So I'm pretty well established and likewise, I've been doing tax deeds for about the same length of time. My true background, I guess you'd say, is in forestry. That's what I went to college for at the University of Missouri. Got my degree and had a succession of jobs. Each one was you know, 12 or so years in term. So I, I was never the person to jump around from place to place. But back in the early days, when I was a lot younger, your typical job would be to work for one of the big timber companies and maybe manage some of their land. And so you have your own little kingdom and manage a bunch of land and have people working with you, supervising people, overseeing planting trees, a lot of different variety there. But those jobs have pretty much all gone away. I got laid off from that job and I saw the handwriting on the wall and I went to the consulting side of life first as a, an employee of a small consulting firm and then later on went into business for myself. And so I'm a freelancer now. I can work part-time at the forestry business and I can dedicate however much time I need to to the real estate side of things, specifically going to tax sales and maintaining the properties that I have, buying and selling and maintaining. And the first thought that came to my mind is, wow, someone went to school and they actually did what they learned in school. <laughs> You're that guy. And nowadays, everybody goes, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I graduate. Oh, my goodness. You really knew what you're going to do, and then you did it. That's uh, terrific. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot of people who went through forestry programs, there were many years when the job market was tight. And so a lot of people ended up selling insurance with their forestry degree or whatever. Oh, uh, in other words, not really using that degree uh, the way they, they thought they would. As we go along, inject things like that because it's always of interest to people. But most people are on the call because they want to talk about tax lien certificates and tax deeds. And you're certainly an expert at that. As a matter of fact, I always tell uh, people in our seminars that so much more about buying open land and range land and forest and whatever that I've never even uh, gotten near that part of it. My part has always been the expertise of buying tax to follow the property for, the, for a low price and selling it for a little higher than that. And you have a, a lot more expertise at that. So why don't you just tell us about maybe like a small deal you did and maybe a big deal you did so people have some idea of the scope of your knowledge in this business. One of my most profitable deals and it was one where I did not even attend the tax sale. How's that for a quirky one? In the course of going to tax sales, I've met a number of investors. And there were investors, there was two people who worked together, and they usually bid on houses in the Atlanta area. And they had bought tax deed on two properties that were almost side by side, they were separated by one other parcel. Same owner, and they sat on a lake. But it was vacant land, and they really weren't sure what to do with vacant land, and they knew that I bid on it a lot, so they offered it for sale to me. So this was a few months after the tax sale had happened, so this is a redeemable tax deed. So what they did was they quick claimed their interest in that tax deed to me, and so now I was basically the owner of the tax deed. I, was, I controlled that tax deed. Since the redemption amount was 20%, we negotiated on it. And I said, I'll pay you 10% more than what you paid at the auction. 
that way if it redeems, I make 10% and you've made your 10% and we're both happy. And if it happens to not redeem, then I will take care of the foreclosure. It turned out it did not redeem. And I ended up selling that property on not a land contract, but on a security deed. And so that meant that they got the deed to the property at the closing. But I was carrying a, basically a mortgage in Georgia. It's called a security deed. And so they were making payments to me, monthly payments, for quite a few years. And just very recently, they, they owed just a few thousand dollars on it, and they cashed me out. But when it was all said and done, I had made a profit of $59,000 on that deal when you count all the interest and just the selling price. And that was from a tax sale I did not even attend. There is a secondary market it, probably in any state. You can sell your interest or you can transfer your interest on a tax lien certificate in other states. And lots of times there will be information on the county website as to how you do that. And in the case of Georgia tax deeds, you've got a recorded deed at the courthouse. And that interest that you have in the property is transferable to anybody else. But, of course, it is subject to the redemption rights of the delinquent taxpayer until those rights are foreclosed. And as long as all parties in the transaction understand that, there's nothing that prevents you from selling a tax deed to somebody else. Uh, there's, there's no reason you can't do that. But one thing I like to say is that a lot of the tax deed properties or even tax lien properties have some kind of challenges. In a lot of cases, there is a reason that property went to the tax sale. And so sometimes you have to work around a challenge that's pre presented in it. It may have to do with how you access the property or one of the strangest ones I had was that I didn't realize until after I had paid for the property, it was one and a half acre lot in a rural subdivision that all the other lots had houses on them. This one didn't. It was a pretty lot. It looked nice from the road. Get the the old deed information after I'd paid for it, and it, it had a little cemetery on it. That was a lot of fun. I It took me a long time to sell it, but I finally sold it to one of the adjacent property owners, and he knew the cemetery was there. And I think I made $300 on that one, but at least I got rid of it. So sometimes you get challenges. That's the only cemetery I've had, and I hopefully I'll never have another one. There will be issues that come up like this you just, because you're, sometimes you have a list of 100, sometimes 400, 500 properties. And you're going through them all, and you're trying to learn as much as you can about every property. And there will be little things that might slip by you. So... Every once in a while, you get a challenge, and you just have to deal with it. More often, those challenges are fairly obvious, and so you have to look at that property and say, do I want to take that challenge on or not? That, that's the more common situation. Is okay, this property is up for the tax sale. It has road access, but all of the adjacent property owners are siblings and relatives of the delinquent taxpayer. Do I want to own a, a piece of property that's that type of situation? That happens all the time. That, that's a real common scenario. Sometimes you'll have a, a property that, here's one that I probably, I don't think I've, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it and I've never heard it mentioned by anybody else, but me as a forester, something I pay attention to is that any place you go, you're going to have invasive plant species that can be a real uh, pain to deal with. So in the Southeast, where I'm most familiar, you have Chinese privet, you have bamboo, you have Bradford pear, also known as calorie pear, you have kudzu. And if you have those things on your property, whether it's a, a house or vacant land, you might just want to steer clear of it. One of the worst ones right now is bamboo. People plant it, it's advertised as a living fence or something fancy like that. And after it gets planted, what you realize is you really just can't control it. It spreads and spreads, and it's almost impossible to stop. And I've seen numerous houses come up on tax sale lists that had bamboo growing right up to the front porch. And so what are you going to do with that? This stuff is so hard to get rid of. And you're, what would you do with a house or a mobile home that's totally engulfed in bamboo? or some other invasive plant. The calorie pear or Bradford pear, 
is spread by birds. And I had one property that was uh, a little over three acres, and it was an abandoned field. And when I acquired it, it was totally covered with trees that were about this tall, and almost all of them were calorie pears. I sold it on a land contract, and one of my stipulations to the buyer was to they'd have to mow it or otherwise maintain it because what happens, they go, grow on up to be moderate tree size. They're covered with thorns, and there's really nothing you can do with it. The thorns are, are stout enough to puncture a tractor tire. So these are types of things that that's something you, you won't hear from anybody else. But I remember one property that was 20 acres and was otherwise a good piece of property, and I didn't even bid on it because it was covered with Chinese privet. And that's another plant that's very hard to get rid of. If you see a, a, a piece of property that has something growing on it that looks like it's going to be difficult to control, maybe find out from your extension service or somebody who knows plants, ask them a question, or otherwise, if you don't know, maybe just don't bid on it. In many parts of the country, trees are a valuable commodity, and uh, sometimes there'll be a property that has merchantable trees on it that comes up at the tax sale. One thing to watch out for, and it'll usually show in the deed records, is that I could sell the trees off my property, but the logger might have two years in which to cut those trees. And so maybe in those, in that, within that two-year span of time, I have failed to pay my taxes, and the property goes to a tax auction. So in that case, the land would be sold, but the trees already belong to somebody else. That's usually in the deed records. It's something called a timber deed. And so if you see a timber deed on that property, read it and see what it says. It might say all merchantable timber. It might say all trees over a certain size or all marked trees or whatever. But it has been my experience. I have of the larger parcels of land that I've purchased at tax sales. I've never gotten one that really had good timber on it. The most common situation is that the delinquent taxpayer cuts the trees, takes the money and runs, doesn't pay the taxes. My most common technique is simply to run a Craigslist ad and at the same time have a real estate sign out there and have one of those info tubes or info box that has flyers in it. And those flyers always have uh, a headline on there, something along the lines of land for sale below assessed value. I always try to make it point out to the people that there's a potential bargain to be had there. And I always point out that there's potential owner financing available. That gets a lot of calls and emails and responses from the ads and from the signs. And so I've sold some properties quite quickly. Now, if the property, if it has a house on it, or if it has some kind of challenge, or if it's a way long way from home, uh, I'll have a real estate agent handle it. I have no problem with having realtors uh, list properties for me. As long as they do their job and earn their commission, I, I'm happy to pay it. I've had a few unusual situations where I've sold properties. That there are some things that just aren't standard at all. For instance, a few years ago, I was going to have to go away for the summer, and I had a property that had a mobile home on it, and I really didn't want the home to be vandalized while I was away. And so I approached the next door neighbor who had a riding lawnmower, and I, I asked him if he would mow the grass. And, and we worked out a deal on that, and, and uh, he said he'd also look after the property. In the course of that conversation, he says, oh, by the way, if you end up owning that property, if it does not redeem, I have a couple of relatives who might be interested in buying it. And it turned out that his niece bought it from me on a land contract. And so by me asking somebody to mow the grass, I ended up selling the property. So that, that was pretty cool. I've had neighbors contact me out of the blue. I even had a bank president contact me unsolicited. He had learned about the tax sale, and a friend of his wanted to buy it. I, another time, I was just out inspecting a property that I'd had for more than a year, and I was getting ready to foreclose on it. It was just a piece of land next to the road. The neighbor saw me and came out on his riding lawnmower, and uh, came on down and asked me what I was doing. It turned out that he had originally owned that piece and had sold it to somebody else, and they let it go to the tax sale, and, and he wanted it back, and so I sold it to him. 
there's been some unusual situations like that. I have a deal going right now where a, a closing will probably be scheduled within the next month where I had a piece of land that I'd gotten at a tax sale and someone who grew up in that area, there's a young couple and they were living down the road from me and they got my phone number from the county office and they called me and said they wanted it. And so we worked out a deal on that one. And the numbers on that one are that it's 14 acres of land. I paid $18,000 for it, and the sales price is going to be 49000 When I'm researching properties, one thing, one thing to watch out for is in, in a lot of counties uh, on their website, there's so much information available on a property. You could go down the rabbit hole and spend hours and hours delving in, in, into information that really is not important. You could find the deed for five transactions back that happened in 1942 or something. That kind of stuff might be interesting, but it has no relevance to the tax sale. Avoid wasting time on things about the property that don't really matter. Pay attention to, I do look at, like if it's a house, what year was it built? I might glance at the square footage because a, a 3,000 square foot house is worth more than a 1,000 square foot house. but how many rooms or whether it's uh, three bedrooms or four doesn't really matter all that much because I'm not paying retail for it. I'm not going to live in it. And if it's a piece of land, I'm just looking at does it have road access? Is it out of a flood floodplain? Is it an attractive piece of property that some someone who looks at it, who's a potential buyer, will look at it and say, I want that piece of land. And so I'm looking at how much money I can make off of it. What's the assessed value? What's the value of the land? What's the value of the improvements? What's the market value? Does the assessed value reflect what the current market is or is there a spread there, negative or positive? So it's really what's my maximum bid and I can still make a decent profit off of it based on today's market. That's really what I'm looking at. So I'll bid on land, I'll bid on houses, uh, every once in a while, I bid on commercial properties, but I don't know it very well. And in the area where I live, uh, probably 90% of all the commercial properties that do come up are properties that are in distressed areas that have been vacant for a long time. And I don't want to even deal with that because the taxes on commercial property are much higher than on residential. And if you acquire a commercial property and you don't know what to do with it and you can't sell it right away, then you have all these taxes and other maintenance costs uh, that might eat you up. I, I typically stay away from commercial, but if that's up your alley, that's an opportunity for you. When you're doing your research, there's certain properties that you need to avoid. And one of them I didn't mention that comes up quite often is that if you have a property that is in a development, let's say that's a subdivision or an apartment complex or a condo complex, where there's a homeowners association. Sometimes that homeowners association gets into financial trouble and they stop paying the taxes on the common areas. And it's very common to see, it might be two acres of land, but it's just all little narrow bands of dirt in between the buildings or something like that. It might be the retention ponds. It might be the, the, the path of the golf, the, where the golf carts run, the, the path or something like that. Some people might get ideas of uh, take that and try to sell it back to them and make a lot of money, but it would be a, a lot more trouble than it's worth, and you'd need to be the confrontational type of person to do it. Usually the common areas are so labeled in the le legal description, so you're going through your list and you see it says 2.2 acres being the common area of such and such an apartment complex. So it's, usually it's really easy to tell. But that's one thing that that you certainly do want to avoid, unless you just have that personality where you 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 want to get involved in something like that. When you're doing your research uh, prior to a tax sale, one of the most most valuable tools that's become available quite recently is that most of the counties now have a website where uh, the property owners can come in and pay their taxes online. And what's good for us is that. Uh, we can use those very same websites to see whether a person has paid their taxes. And so we got our property list, and let's say that the county is not updating that list online, and we're wanting to find out of this list of 100 properties 
how many of these people have come in recently and paid their taxes. Well, we can go to that tax payment website, copy and paste the parcel numbers into that website, and it will instantly tell us whether the taxes are current or delinquent on that parcel. And so the ones that have been, the show has been recently paid, we cross off the list, and so we know not to pay attention to those anymore. So that is a really valuable research tool that by spending a few minutes on that tax payment website, you can save a few hours uh, of because you're not looking at properties that have already been paid for. Did you know that four times a year, Ted Thomas invites students to a three-day auction preparation workshop? It's very exciting because Ted and the coaches tell all the students how to make big deals and little deals live in the room. If you're interested, email info at tedthomas.com for more information. Again, that's info at tedthomas.com for more information. Hi, everyone. We're back. And my guest today is Lee Phillips. Now, Lee's an attorney. And as I said earlier on the podcast, thank goodness I've known him for all these years because he certainly helped me and he's helped literally hundreds of my clients. And I just want you guys to meet him today. And I'm going to ask him to talk a little bit about some of the things it takes to be successful as an entrepreneur. For example, you're going to have questions. Do you need an LLC? Should you have a will and on? So Lee's an expert. I'm just going to let him talk for a few minutes and tell you a little bit about some of the things that you need. So Lee, are you on there today? I am, Ted. How are you? I'm just great. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Here in Florida today, it's a, a warm day and I hope it's nice where you are. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. So to remind everybody, and then let's talk about some of the things that people need to be as some of the legal things they need to do. I should put that more specifically, some legal things they need to take care of on the way to being a successful entrepreneur. Okay. I'm like you've alluded to, I'm a liar. That yeah. That's taxing for attorney, right? Y'all go down and see your liar. Yes. At, at any rate, I'm actually a counselor in the United States Supreme Court. So mm-hmm. most attorneys can't say that. And I've helped thousands of, of clients across the United States with building their wealth and protecting it. And it's just as important today that you learn how to protect it as it is that you uh, learn how to make it. Because unfortunately, in today's society, there's an attitude, if you've got it, I'm entitled to it. People are even more adept at taking it away from you than they used to be. And it's not just, just the lawsuit or things that you think about in asset protection your biggest asset protection threat is the IRS. Wow. They're taking a big chunk of it. 56% of all bankruptcies in the United States are a result of somebody in the family gets sick. So the question is, you're teaching people how to fight tax deeds and tax liens and all of these things. They've got good pieces of property. The question is, are they going to lose those pieces of property when it spouse or a kid or somebody in the family gets sick. Now, you don't even have to be doing anything wrong today in order to worry about asset protection. And in fact, I've got a story I'm going to tell you for two seconds, Ted. Just take your you, time. We've got plenty of time. You've never heard this one. I have a friend. He's a very good friend. He was the president of, of my high school. And oh. that's how long I, I've known him almost longer than I've known you, Ted. Wow. <laughs> that's a long uh, time. <laughs> he, He has a nice business. He does real estate. He bought an industrial piece of land and all the industrial buildings were gone on it. But there was a guardhouse type thing on it. And a couple came to him and said they wanted to rent it. And the management company that manages all of his property rented it to them. And in the meantime, the city inspected it and said that it wasn't occupiable. So the management company sent them a a letter, the couple a letter, and in his words, they were one step above homeless. He wasn't charging them hardly anything. And last January, the couple smoked and they were smoking in bed and started a fire. Oh boy. And they both got out. Apparently the woman went back in for her purse or something and she died. And they have now, the state has charged my friend with murder. Oh my goodness. 
Uh, he is actually going to trial this late this summer for murder. Oh. Um, they say well, you should have evicted him. They weren't supposed to be in there, and it's your fault that she died and you killed her. And oh the God. state is prosecuting him, and the family is, of course, suing him. Oh. His business was set up as a corporation, uh -huh. and I'll explain it in a minute, but that means he's going to lose his business, which his son was going to take over because he was retiring, and it's a big uh -huh. business. We should have protected that. We should have protected lots of things. He thought he did things right. The point of the matter is you never know where this stuff comes from. Wow. And now that the event has occurred, it substantially limits the things that you can do in order to try and protect yourself, protect your property, protect your family. And he said to me the other day, I'm mentally, I can go to jail, but I just don't want to lose everything for my family. No, all that work and all those years, I can imagine. Oh, so wow. anyway, it, it comes from all over. Hey, your students have learned how to do tax deeds. They've got pieces of property. Maybe there's a guardhouse on one of those pieces oh, of property. Oh, we, we just don't know what happens. If he had the piece of property in an LLC, the family's lawsuit would have been limited to the LLC and the assets owned by the LLC. And they would have had to have done what we call pierce the corporate veil in order to have actually gotten to him and his personal assets and his business. Had his business been an LLC instead of a corporation, when they sue him, they'll take the stock in his corporation. Once they have the stock in the corporation, they own the company right. because it's a closely held company. His son owns a little bit of it, but he owns the oh. majority of it. What a tragedy. And oh once God. they get the stock, they own the company, period. Wow. Uh, if it had been an LLC, the LLC has a reverse asset protection, a reverse of the corporate veil. The corporate veil protects you from what happens in the company. If the company causes a problem, in theory, the officers, owners, directors, managers, they're not liable personally for what happens within the company. As long as they've done their homework and kept their corporate veil up and done the formalities and all that stuff that they're supposed to do. Corporation does not have the reverse asset protection that an LLC has. An LLC has what we call charging order protection and it allows the company assets to be protected from the personal liabilities of the owner. In this case, we've got a personal liability of the owner. The owner is getting sued, and if they were to lose the lawsuit, then the creditors, we call them, the guys who won the lawsuit, they just can't come in and take the stock in the LLC, we call them membership interests, but they can't just come in and take the stock, the membership interests, and take over the LLC. They have to go back to court and get an order which charges the debt that the owner of the LLC has, and it charges the LLC with that debt. They can't manage the LLC, they can't take ownership of it, the guy could continue to work for it, could continue to get a salary, but if the LLC own, uh, uh, gets any profit, declares a profit, then the creditor basically has an economic lien, a charging order against the LLC, and any profit declared in the LLC would go to the creditor. That's very different than coming in and taking the stock and owning everything. So your students, when they get their deed, uh, they should put it into some sort of an LLC. Wow. That way that piece of property would be protected from their personal problems. In addition, if there's a guard house on the piece of property and somebody gets killed, it's confined to the inside of the LLC and the assets that the LLC has.
Does that make sense, Ted? I think what you just said, and see if I can summarize, I think what you said, if they had an LLC, which might cost, I remember what they are, 750 or 1000 or $1,200, whatever they are, he would have saved all that grief that you just went through. Is that pretty close? Well, that's pretty close. And in Utah, it's under 100 bucks. Oh, my God. Uh, it depends oh on which God. state you're oh. in. Uh, California is one of the more expensive. They're only 850 bucks a year. Oh, uh, and oh my. Some of them, Arizona doesn't even have a fee. So wow. it has a wow. setup fee, but no annual fee. That's so amazing. That's absolutely it depends, amazing. Depends on where you are as to how much it's going to be. But yeah, it's well worth the few hundred bucks on average that you're going to spend for the LLC. Now, you may not need an LLC for each one of your tax deeds. And I might not mix tax deeds and tax liens. I might do my tax liens under a one LLC and my tax deeds under another one so that I actually own the piece of property separate from the tax liens. Nice, um, nice, really, you're, wow. That... You're dividing up what you're doing, divide your activities into to separate pockets, so to speak. And wow. it's if I'm walking down the street and I get my wallet picked, I'm through. But if I put some of my money in my front pocket and I get my wallet picked, then they didn't get it all, did they? At least you got bus fare to get home, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah that kind of helps. <laughs> or if you're hungry, you can have dinner on the way home. Yeah, something like have, that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the lawyers love to say, well, you should put some of your money in your other front pocket and you should put some of the money yeah. in your shoe and you should yeah. stuff some down your underpants and put yeah. some in your bra. Yeah. yeah. I look good in a bra, by the way. Oh, please. Oh, please. I know better. I know better. Oh, my Sorry. God. Listen, let's talk about something that comes up all the time. All let, right. let me make one more point with this. Okay. Don't right. go overboard. Don't get 59 LLCs, okay? Oh, my. Oh my. Yeah, that would be... Uh, so if you get too be... many of these legal pockets, you got a problem. Go ahead. What will okay. you say? The next thing that comes up all the time, and, and it's, it's the world we live in today because the uh, people get sick and in the, in the old days, he just died. <laughs> but people don't die anymore, and they stay around for a long time. So this, this can cause a lot of bankruptcies, and people will lose a lot of assets. And that I'm not even counting the grief. I'm a single guy, so I don't have a lot of uh, people to take care of. But I know some families are just devastated by all this. So what should they be doing in that arena to be thinking about taking care of themselves and their family? Well, there's no question that we can be kept alive a lot longer. Yeah. I deal with this in my own personal circumstances. My wife is in her fifth year of ALS, and it's extremely expensive. You carry health insurance, and that pays for a chunk of it, but there's a lot of it the health insurance isn't paying for. You can carry disability policies, and the fact is you're going to be disabled 90 days or longer prior to the time that you die. That's the statistic. Oh, really? Yeah, don't look at me like that, Ted. I've already had my 90 days, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you need the legal documentation to take care of somebody when they become disabled or incompetent. And that would be a durable power of attorney. A oh, general yeah. power of attorney automatically kicks out when the individual becomes incompetent. Durable power of attorney survives through the incompetency and allows the agent, the guy that you appoint, usually a kid or somebody, one of your children, adult children, right. but allows them to come in and take over and manage all of the affairs on your behalf. So it's important that you have the legal document printed out. It's boilerplate. It's in the materials I supply at, at Ted's events. And by the way, when's your next you got a three-day event coming up? Yeah, we have one coming up, and I think the next one's right in the first week of September, right after the, uh, the Labor Day holiday. Okay. Do you think you'll be able to make that event? You can certainly come on video if you like. I don't know. You've been very gracious to have me on video. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see how Christy is. If she's died, I'll be there. Okay. Uh, All right. I'd well, love to. I'm not wishing she's going to die, so I'll plan on the video. <laughs> plan on the video. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, the durable power of attorney is very important. And when somebody dies, we have the assets, the properties that you've bought from the tax deeds or the tax liens, their property. Yeah. And if they're not properly taken care of, then the family has to probate them and it's going to be a mess. Oh. So that's another reason that you put them in an LLC. 
Oh, yeah. Now you got to worry about the LLC ownership too, because that's a probatable asset. So technically the LLC is owned by your living revocable trust. And yes, that's as far as it goes. We don't have 16 layers deep, but if the trust owns it, then the trustee can come in and manage the LLC and manage the property within the LLC when you die. So yeah. it makes it a lot easier on the family. And if you do become incompetent, then the durable power of attorney makes it a lot easier on the family. And these are pretty simple documents. You can expect to pay, oh, anywhere from $2,500 to $10,000 on the street for the package of a living revocable trust and the durable power of attorney and stuff. So that's reasonable today. We'll talk about that more at, at Ted's three-day events and explain what you can do and what you can't do in a lot more detail. So talk a little bit about the, the need for a couple of these things. For example, I completely understand after that example you just did of the LLC, that's certainly important. I certainly understand, and I think most people do, the need for a, a durable power of attorney because a parent uh, could easily have a heart attack on very short notice or even be in a car accident today and suddenly they're going to pass on or, but they might be in a hospital and that allows that person to make a decision to plug or unplug and that kind of thing, doesn't it? The durable power of attorney doesn't actually do that, but it's often coupled and I always couple it with the living will that allows the individual to do that, direct the medical needs. And oh, yeah. Today you have to have a HIPAA agreement or the doctors can't talk to you because of the privacy acts and it goes on and on. I see. Uh, okay. We've got way too many regulations. Yeah, there's a lot to think of. From a narrow casting standpoint here, let's move over to, I realize people need that. And of course, you always give at least a two-hour session that we they get to not only listen, but ask questions of you. But let's talk just a little bit about taxes, if you would. I know a lot of people say, oh, I live in so-and-so. I don't have this tax and I don't have that tax. But at the end of the road, when they maybe own these properties or certainly tax certificates. More and more people buy tax certificates today because it's such a simple investment and they don't have to do any work. And that's what a lot of my clients like. And so these tax certificates earn income, which doesn't sound like much at uh, 18%, but after a few years of owning them, you hear a lot of rejoicing going on because, oh, I only put 700 bucks in and look at this, I got almost $1,500 back when they, the principal and interest starts adding up. So these people have, many of these certificates and there's a consequent here on the tax. So just a little briefing on that. We won't have, we've got uh, about 12 minutes left. So give us a little insight into that. I mean, what I'm trying to do is get the clients here to start thinking if they'll come to an event, we can do a lot for them. But if they don't come to the event, they need to think of these things. Um, we're providing a service that they should be thinking about doing these things, no matter where they're doing their investment or where they're carrying on, you know, their life, they, they need these things. You indicated that the individuals make an 18% interest. I don't know if you've ever heard the statement, but it's one of my favorite. Rich people make interest, poor people pay interest. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. You can Absolutely. make interest, it's a big deal. Yeah. I alluded to the fact earlier that the IRS is your major impediment to financial success. It's an asset protection threat. Right. They're taking a big chunk of what you're making and, and don't think they're not taking the chunk. In fact, we don't even call it taxes anymore. We just call it fees. But it's a tax. <laughs> that's right. And if you can control taxes, that's huge. Yeah. People don't understand taxes. And as a result, they just blow it off. The government's been smart in that they take the taxes up front. They, the employer takes it out of your check. You never see the taxes. If you actually had to cut a check every month, that the employer has to cut out of your salary, you'd go berserk. Exactly. So the taxes are huge. And I'm going to explain this in detail. I don't have time now, but I'll explain it in detail at the three-day event. Taxes are, well, what's the eighth wonder of the world? Compound, compound interest. interest. Absolutely. Taxes are compound interest in reverse. If I can save you... 10% on your taxes and you make a thousand bucks, that's not just a hundred bucks. Over your lifetime, that's a huge amount of money. So controlling the taxes is a, is a big deal. 
if you set up the companies and have the pass-throughs file a Schedule E, then the new Trump tax laws, and I still haven't seen this published anywhere, and you need to make sure that you got it this past year. If you have pass-through income, Schedule C, Schedule E, and LLC, S Corporation, if you have pass-through income, you should be getting 20% of your profit tax-free. It's wow. Section 199A, 199A of the IRS code. And you need to make sure your account got it because I have seen accounts just blow through it this year. Really? And 20% of your profit tax-free isn't anything to sneeze at. That's right. That's right. So uh, make sure you got that. Uh, that's one thing that you can do. The companies, the LLCs, the corporation, allow you to do things that you can't do as an individual. They are taxed differently than you as an individual. So if we play off of the taxation structures of the LLC or the corporation and divide income, so to speak, between the company and you, we can get a lower tax by reclassifying the income, by taking advantage of the ability to do deductions and things in the company that you can't get deductions for. So there's just lots of things that you can do. A person who is nothing more than a 1099 or even, uh, excuse me, a, a W-2 or even a 1099, the guy who just makes money by having somebody else pay him will never get ahead financially. They're in the trap. There are two primary tax shelters that are available to you today. One is called real estate, and the other one is called a small business. If you learn how to use your real estate and learn how to use your small business, you can get ahead financially. Trump can't afford to have them get a hold of all of his tax returns. People won't understand what's going on. No, he hasn't paid a lot of taxes. Yes, he makes billions of dollars. But the tax shelter of the real estate allows him to do that. It's 100% legal. Rich people who own real estate understand that. You're buying real estate with the tax deeds. It's a tax shelter for you. It's a big deal. You're not so, breaking the law. You're following the law. Absolutely. 199%. Yep. Uh, you're following the law. And a lot of people and, are going to be mad about that because they're going to say they can't do it. But they could have if they just bought real estate as a tax shelter. Yeah. And, and Trump understands that. You may or may not like him. But the fact yeah. of the matter is he's made a lot of money in real estate. He's lost money in real estate, but you can carry forward the losses. It yeah. goes on and on. The advantages of the small business and the real estate. You inherently know that people who have property somehow get rich. Yeah, the property appreciates and this and that and the other, but it's a tax shelter too. It shelters your income. And I started out a little while ago by saying taxes are a big deal. If I can cut your taxes 20%, that's just not an extra 100 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it is on $1,000. It's a big deal. It's millions of dollars over a lifetime if you understand the taxes and how to deal with them. Okay, talk about the tax shelter that a small business is because most people don't realize they might want to do their first deal as a personal asset, but after that, they do want to have a business. And could you talk just a little bit about some of the deductions are just a small business gets as compared to the individual? You write off your computers and your cell phones and all of that stuff, your mileage. But additionally, you get the 199A, 20% of your profit tax-free. So there are just myriads of things that the small business can do that you can't do tax-wise as an individual. You can set up your retirement plans, your 401ks, you can get your benefit plans, your HSAs, your HRAs. All of these things allow you to put a lot of money away and not have it taxed. And you can't do most of these things. It's your small business that can do them. Are you about out of time, Ted? I don't no, want to you're, 
No, you got another minute. Could you, and it's a long minute, take your time and just tell people what you're going to talk about. Normally at one of our events, we usually give you two long sessions, which we don't control the time on because we know so many people want to be taking notes and learning. So tell them a little bit about the learning at an event. Our next one will be in September, but I'll promo that after we get done the call. So if you take a- Well, in the first section, I generally talk about the tools that an attorney has to use to build your- business structure, your estate plan, your tax plan, it all melts together. And a lawyer only has so many tools. Once you know how to use the tools, you may not have to actually build the structure, but you know that you can build a structure using these various tools. So you need to understand the tools. The second session, we usually go into the LLC in a lot more detail because the LLC is by far the most flexible tool that an attorney has today. And most attorneys do not understand a lot of aspects of the LLC. They're really pretty cool. So we talk about that in the second session to a great degree. And we talk a lot about taxes. You're, you're taxed to death. It's tax tax. Exactly. exactly. I, I teach you about taxes. I demonstrate the reverse nature of the tax. If it, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world, why are taxes the opposite? So we go into those types of things. We, we have some Thank time. I, I enjoy Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm blessed to have you come and speak at our events because you're the only one that makes it easy and gets down to earth and tells people, look, you really have to do this because, not you just have to do this because I'm telling you. One thing every uh, promoter that I've ever uh, worked with forgets and I don't want to forget is what I'm going to say now. And that's it. Could you just take a minute and tell everybody why you're qualified to help them? I got into this area of the law by accident. I'm supposed to be a patent attorney. And I did four or five weeks as a patent attorney. And then I got sick. And I spent five months in intensive care at a university hospital. Wow. And I had my wife and our three little kids. And we lost everything. The legal system took us to the cleaners. So when I finally got to the point where I could work, one of my top priorities was to figure out how this, how to make it so this didn't happen to me again. And over the years, I've published a lot about it. I've taught a lot of continuing education classes for the lawyers and dentists and doctors and everybody else. So over the years, this has been my passion and, and where I've placed my time and my effort. In fact, you may not know it, Ted, but in my office now, I have two new guys. One is a seven-year special agent, special auditor for the IRS. He did the big criminal cases. And stuff. Whoa, I want him to look at my taxes. Man. And it's amazing what he can do looking at your taxes. Uh, he can put you right in jail. No, I meant the other way around. I don't want to pay any more taxes. <laughs> the other guy is was the former head of the Western Division of the IRS, and He's been with us about a year and a half. Nice. He has 32 nice. years with him. So when I say the IRS is a big deal, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. Lee, that was fantastic. Thank you again. That was really good. What a blessing. 